Hey, I got a question for you. Have you ever had trouble forgiving you? Are there some things in your past that you could go back and erase and rewrite if you could? Well, you can't, but there is something you can do. And I want to show you how to do that in this message. It's called, It's Above Me Now. I want you to sit down. I want you to be in a place where you're undistracted because I believe God is about to speak to you through this message. Here's the one thing I always ask you for. I only ask you for one thing. And that is, if this message blesses you, just send it to somebody else. That's it. We want to help as many people as possible, and I can't do that without your help. Thank you so much. Let me know in the comments if this message blesses you. It encourages me to hear how God's encouraging you through this ministry. Take care. And we're excited about that. So, man, let's keep that in mind. All right. So I want to get right to work. Um, there is... We're in a series called God Didn't Say That, and there's a message I want to share today coming from the book of Philippians chapter number three, beginning at verse number 10. I think y'all had an extra hour today, so I know these amens, is, they're about to be coming in hot. I mean, it's just, y'all ready, right? <laughs> okay. So Philippians chapter three, verse 10, Paul says this, I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. And so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead, not that have already attained this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. I want to stop the reading of scripture there and talk from this subject in our time together. It's above me now. Yeah. Clap your hands if you're ready for God's word. It's above me now. As we leap into this lesson on today, I want to lift up a quote that I think warrants repeating and warrants being reflected upon. And the quote is simply this. Great men and women are only born for the time they are needed the most. <laughs> Great men and women are only born for the time they are needed the most. In other words, if God is a God of providence, pro video, a God that sees before, then it means this, that my birth is not accidental. Come on that I am not the consequence of some cosmic coincidence. I'm not the result of some relational accident. I'm not the fruit of some fling. That even if my parents didn't plan my arrival, God did. And that God orchestrated and arranged that I would be placed on this planet for such a time as this. So I exist in purpose. I exist on purpose. I exist by purpose. But if great men and women are only born for the time that they're needed the most, it means then that not only is my birth itself intentional, but the timing of my birth is intentional also. In other words, it's not just important that I was born, but God knew when I needed to be born. He knew the period in human history I needed to be born in. I remember the in the beginning stages of the pandemic I was having a conversation with a group of pastors that I, were men, that I was mentoring and we were trying to figure out how to navigate an unprecedented season and one of the revelations I had personally I shared with them communally and shared with them I was born for this <laughs> that if God wanted me to be in spiritual leadership at another point in human history, he would arrange for me to be in spiritual leadership before this or after this. But the fact that this has happened on my watch meant that God himself knew that I had something on the inside of me that would aid and assist us in navigating this season. And I don't know who this is for at the 1230 service, but I want you to know that such is the case for you, that God knows the era and the age you needed to be born in. So if you facing it, you can handle it because if you couldn't handle it, he would have dropped you at a different point in human history. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? 
Great men and women are only born for the time that they need it most. So it means we shouldn't then loathe our era. We shouldn't loathe our age. We should love our era. We should love our age because God knew that there was something, come on church, that the era I was born in needed to deposit in me so that I could be who God's called me to be because different eras shape people in different ways. See, some of you grew up in an era where the era taught you manners. Okay, maybe that's the 1030 and 845. Come on, I said, well, it taught you manners. And manners aren't manners. Manners are relational intelligence. Manners are a revelation that your greatest blessings don't walk into your life, don't roll in your life on four wheels. They walk in your life on two legs. And so when you are mismanaging people, you might be messing up your blessing. Come on. This is why people need to be conscious and careful about how they treat you because they don't know what you can do and they don't know who you know. And some people are mismanaging you now because they don't understand the treasure that's in your earthen vessel. But God's got a way that's mighty sweet and he will have people spinning the block and having to come back like Joseph Brothers did and say, I mistreated you in a previous season, but I need you in this one. So the eras and the areas shape us in ways. People laugh at the fact that I grew up in Kill Michael, Mississippi. God knew there was something about the area that I needed to be in that shaped me in ways that prepared me for. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? So sometimes we are complaining about something that was actually an asset in our life. Some of the very things that might have agitated me about Kill Michael, Mississippi were things that God used as an asset to shape me into who he wanted me to be. I love my era. So I grew up in the 80s and the 90s. I know this is 1230, so most of y'all didn't, but... I, that, I grew up in the 80s in the 90s. I grew up in an era where if you were bored and you told your mama you were bored, your mama said, go outside. <laughs> what? And do what? Go outside. Just go outside. <laughs> yeah, I grew up in an era where you actually had to go outside and interact physically with your friends you, like we had to look at each other we could touch each other I mean that's just listen I, I, I grew up I, I grew up in an area that I love I love my era I love the TV shows of my era I, 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 I love family matters living single Moesha hanging with Mr. Cooper Sister, sister, the Fresh Prince of Bel Air. No, 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 no. Some of you are like, I watched that. No, you watching 2.0. That's not the original. The one you watching, Jeffrey got way too much swag. The real Jeffrey don't have that much swag. I grew up watching you go, girl. You go, Gina. Martin. I love my era. I love the candy of my era. Y'all don't know, I had sugar, sugar candy. Hmm? I'm talking about, y'all don't know anything about red hots. Lemon heads. Now, laters. See, if you put an and on it, you don't know what you're talking about. Now and later. No, now later. <laughs> I know y'all don't remember this. Chico sticks. Sugar babies. Sugar daddy. Pause, 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 pause. Not that kind, pause. Watch this. This is for somebody that had a grandmama in church. Werther's original. <laughs> uh, 
Hey, and what about the candy jewelry, the candy necklace? <laughs> the candy bracelet? And you were really balling if you had a ring pop. It took you eight hours to finish that ring pop. I love my era. I love the music of my era. Come on, I love that smooth music, that baby face, that Brian McKnight, that Luther Vandross, that Drew Hill, Jagged Edge, Mint Condition. 112, boys to men, y'all not ready, high five, H-Town boys, Black Street, come on, then I went on the other side a little bit too, I love that smooth, but I'm just keeping it real, I grew up, I went on the other side a little bit too, a little bit of Onyx, a little bit of Wu-Tang Clan, a little bit of Naughty by Nature, a little bit of Nas, a little bit of Notorious B.I.G. Let me go down south. A little bit of Outcast. Let me go to the N.O., the Hot Boys. Juvenile. Let me go to the Dirty Dirty. Y'all not ready for this? Eight Ball and M.J.G. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let me bring it back. SWV, Escape, TLC, come on. I love my era. And I even love the books of my era. There were all sorts of books, but my favorite type of books were comic books. And comic books were these, it was, it was, it was written, they were literary pieces that told stories. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> so it's illustrated storytelling that combined pictures and text. So it was like a movie in magazine form. And what many people don't know is that there are certain characters that one generation got introduced to on a movie screen that my generation got introduced to in a comic book. Iron Man didn't start off on the movie screen. Iron Man started off as a comic book. Fantastic Four, comic book. Black Panther, comic book. Wonder Woman, comic book. Incredible Hulk, comic book. Spider-Man, comic book. Batman, Comic book, my favorite, Wolverine. Comic book. And as I was reflecting on my era, preparing for this preaching presentation, I realized something, that we have something in common with these superheroes we often admire. That, that we don't have superpowers, but God's given us power that helps us do super things. Did you hear what I just said? Yeah, they, they, they had powers that helped them accomplish their purpose. And God's given us power that helps us accomplish ours. Come on. They had gifts that helped them accomplish their assignment. And God's given us gifts that help us accomplish ours. Am I making sense here? He's given us spiritual gifts. Charis mata, numa. Ticos. When I talk about these gifts, family, prayer is a spiritual superpower. Praise. Oh, I got to teach on that. I said I got to teach on that. Because we say when praises go up, blessings come down. God didn't say that. The Bible says when praises go up, the blesser comes down. That when you praise, you don't get gifts, you get God. He says, if you'll praise me, I'll show up. I will dwell. Come on, Psalms 122. I will dwell in the praises of my people. Your praise is the bat signal. They missed it. 
Your praise is the way you send notice to God. I need you to come by here and tabernacle here. Prayer is a superpower. Praise is a superpower. Fasting is a superpower. Prophecy is a superpower. Discernment, spidey senses, that's a superpower. Word of knowledge is a superpower. We've been giving superpowers, but one of the most powerful superpowers that I want to lift up today that everyone in this room has is similar to the superpower Wolverine had, and that is you and I have the ability to facilitate our own healing. What, PD? Yep, you and I have been given the power to facilitate our own healing. Pastor, when did he give us that power? Is that what the gift of healing is? No, 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 no. That spiritual gift is for other people. It's not for you. Well, when did God give me the ability to facilitate my own healing? When he gave us the capacity to exercise forgiveness. Yeah, the 845 and 1030, they responded the same way. When I, the, I said he gave us, come on church, he gave us the ability to facilitate our own healing when he gave us a superpower called forgiveness. And what the enemy doesn't want us to do is to get a revelation on how to use this superpower. He wants to present this superpower as some sort of weakness and capitulation and cooperation with someone abusing, misusing, and exploiting you, not realizing that this is a superpower. When you know how to use it right, it insulates you from the injuries being perpetuated on you by imperfect people. Come on. This superpower is the way you fight against the enemy of bitterness and resentment and cynicism and jadedness and hard-heartedness and emotional up and downness. Come on. The absence of forgiveness leads to the presence of emotional torture. You do not forgive give as a sign of weakness you forgive as a sign of strength you do not forgive because you like the person that hurt you you forgive because you love yourself and you refuse to stay a victim of somebody else's selfishness God gives us this superpower because he gives nothing that he intends for us to waste. He gives us this superpower because there's a reality that many people fail to embrace. It's a reality that many people fail to accept. So they're living life in this bubble of deception. They're moving with an assumption that the world is the way they like it to be as opposed to a revelation that the world is the way God says it is. So here is life. Can, I, can we just talk life? Yeah. I say, can we just talk life? Yeah. Here's the reality. The truth sets us free from living lives, from, from living a life of deception, being deceived. See, you do know the nature of deception is you don't know you're deceived. Y'all miss it. I said the nature of deception is we don't know we're deceived. And so when we're living life, thinking life works one way and it doesn't work that way, we need truth to set us free from that deception so we can move the way we need to move based on the way life is, not the way we think it should be. So here's the way it is. We live in an imperfect world that's filled with imperfect people who make imperfect decisions, and as a result, there will be times where you and I are affected by the imperfect decisions that somebody else makes. See, it got quiet. Here's real life. Sometimes we will suffer not because of what you did. Sometimes we will suffer because of what someone else did. Come on. We become the victims of someone else's imperfections this is life we can dislike it we can dismiss it but we can't alter it or adjust it this is the truth about life and this truth sets us free from the false expectations that this won't happen 
And if I'm moving like this won't happen, I'm going to be unprepared for the inevitable. And to be unprepared for the inevitable is to be naive. It's like seeing rain and refusing to take an umbrella because you're denying it's rain. But your denial of the rain don't stop you from getting wet. I wish I had a church that would talk back to me at this 1230 service. The reality is this. The only way you can avoid injury based on other people's imperfections is to cut off total proximity. Proximity means vulnerability. Did you hear what I just said? Did you hear what I just said? You can get sick not because you went out the house with a coat. Y'all missed it. You can get sick because somebody else went outside of the house without wearing a coat or hat and they caught something and because of your proximity. You suffer because of what they did. Come on here. Proximity means vulnerability. When you date somebody and you say it's me and you, you trust in their decisions. I don't hear nobody. Come on. You are vulnerable to their decisions. When you say I do, you are saying I am vulnerable to being impacted by your decisions. If you don't want to be vulnerable, don't have friends. Don't have a team. Don't have children. Don't have a spouse because other people can make a decision that impacts your life. Sometimes your schedule is at the mercy of what somebody you love do. I got to. And so because God knows this, what God does is he gives you and I a superpower that we need so that what happens for me ultimately is not determined by what people do to me. He says, I'm going to teach you how to respond to something that's inevitable. That at some point, no matter how many boundaries you set, no matter how many filters you try to put people through, no matter how guarded you are in some seasons of life, God, this is what my pastor says, will delete your discernment. Y'all not talking to me. God says, no, you think I'm going to let you get every decision right? If, if, you, if I let you get every decision right, where would you learn humility? Where would you learn how to depend on me? Where would you learn patience? Where would you learn resilience? So sometimes I'm not talking to you because I'm not talking to you. Because there's something I want you to experience so that you realize the importance of depending on me. I don't care how much you pray. There's some people you're going to miss. I don't care how attentive you are, there are some times you're not going to see the signs that you wish you should have seen. Sometimes you're naive, and other times God deletes your discernment. He says, because, because I'm not trying to show you something about them. I'm trying to show you something about people. Y'all miss it. I'm not trying to show you something about them. I'm trying to show you something about people. Y'all missed it. I want you to be surprised by them so that you know it's possible, it's possible to be surprised by people. I wanted you to experience that so that you would know what people are capable of. Not for you to be jaded and cynical, but for you to be prepared to quickly utilize this superpower when you deal with offense so that when it happens you don't let it fester so that when it happens you don't let it change you so that when it happens you don't delay and live with it for months and years and letting what somebody did in the past control your future I want you to learn how to exercise this muscle so that when they hurt you you release them so that when they hurt you you release them not because you like them, but because you love yourself. Listen to me. You better get good at this. This is one thing you better get good at. This is one thing you better get good at. Forgiveness. Now here's the issue. Are y'all ready for this? I said, y'all ready for this? 
All right, here's the issue. The issue is people don't often take this seriously because they assume that just because they're not in pain, they're healed. Oh, no, no, PD, I'm over it. No, 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 you're not in pain. Don't that mean I'm over it? Nope, it just means it don't hurt no more. But it doesn't mean that that's still not hurting you. Y'all missed it. Me not hurting anymore doesn't mean it's not hurting me. Me not being in pain doesn't mean I'm healed. You see, if my father, if my father, you to shake my father's hand, you'll see that one of my father's pinkies is like this. It cannot extend all the way out. That's because years ago, he and I were playing basketball when I was a kid, and um, I was trying to get a rebound or something, and I hit his hand, and I heard it pop. I heard it broke, break. Now, my dad, old school. My dad's like, it'll be all right. So he didn't go to the doctor. Or any, so watch this. It did. Watch this. The bone did grow back together. It just grew back crooked. Are y'all ready? I said, are y'all ready? Are y'all ready? Okay, here it is. But he's not in pain. But his fingers still look like this. He can use it, but he doesn't have full use of it. But it's been that way for so long. He's become used to working around a pinky that won't extend. <laughs> Did y'all hear what I just said? So he's been, his pinky hadn't been working properly so long, he don't remember what a properly working pinky feel like. So now a properly... A, a pinky, a pinky that doesn't work properly has become his normal, even though it's abnormal. Are y'all okay? Do you believe I love you? Do you believe I prepare like I love you? Okay, so can I speak the truth in love? Some of our hearts look like my daddy hand. <laughs> we using it and we not hurt anymore but we don't have full use of it. It's not used to the maximum of its potential. Because we assume because I'm no longer in pain, I'm not hurt. So now when it comes to connecting with people, the way we need to connect, for some it's difficult to really receive love. And for others it's difficult to really give love. But if you're with somebody that's never been loved right, they don't know you withholding. And if withholding is your normal, you don't know you withholding either. Gosh. If you think not fully giving yourself, if not fully giving your heart is normal, then what happens is you don't know that my heart looked like the hand. Because it's been so long since my hand worked right. I've, long, I've learned how to get along with a broken hand. And if I'm surrounded by people and they ring finger crooked and the other's middle finger crooked and the other's thumb is crooked and the other index finger is crooked because we all got crooked hands. Nobody's holding me accountable to straighten it out. Y'all are not talking to me. So now all our toxicity gets together. And we are confirming toxic behavior. We're affirming to come on. That's right. Don't trust. That's right. Don't give your. That's right. It's toxic confirmation. Forgiveness is what keeps my heart from not looking like my daddy's hand. I don't even have time to deal with that heart. Solomon says, out of it flows the issues of life. It shows up everywhere. 
I was at this business event yesterday and, and we were talking, I was being interviewed about leadership and I was talking about emotional intelligence and leadership because if there's insecurity in your heart, it's going to show up in your leadership. You're going to want talent that, you can, that your heart can't handle. Y'all missed it. Your vision will require talent that your insecurity can't steward properly. You can't outrun it. Wherever you go is going to show up. Am I making sense? So this, 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 this is so important. Somebody say forgiveness. Okay. The only way to keep something that hurt you from continuing to hurt you is forgiveness. What does forgiveness mean? It means to pardon and it means to release one's debt. Are y'all ready for this? It means that I have a revelation that you are unable to give me what you took. That what you took from me, you're unable to pay. If you steal money from me, you stole more than my money. And the only thing you can give me back is money. You can't give me back my bad days when I was looking for it. You can't give me back the, the trauma from somebody I trusted doing me like that. Come on now. You can't give me back the inconvenience that it caused me, the stuff I had to move around and rearrange. The only thing you can give me back is, a, is money. An apology don't give me my time back. An apology don't give me my job. Y'all not talking to me. It, it, so it means what you took from me, you can't pay. And no matter how I talk to you, it's still not in your account. No matter how much I fuss, it's still not in your account. No matter how much I explain to you what you did to me, it's still not in your account. So I have to write it off as bad debt. And say what you owe me, you're incapable of paying. And I can't hold my moving on to you getting a revelation of what you did to me. This is why the most powerful form of forgiveness is seen with Jesus on the cross and Stephen in Acts 7. It's called unilateral forgiveness. So transactional forgiveness is one type. Unilateral forgiveness is another type. Transactional, a transaction takes place. You ask for forgiveness, I give it to you. Unilateral forgiveness is I forgive you when you don't ask for it. <laughs> Let me tell you why that's important. Because most people that need your forgiveness don't know it. Pastor, yes they do. No, they don't. Yes they do. They know what they did. They don't know themselves though. Jesus on the cross said, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. Forgive them. They, they narcissistic. They're hypersensitive. They're territorial. Come on. They're egotistical. And they are so blind to who they are, they can't see the error in what they did. So you can't hold your life hostage waiting on an apology from somebody who don't even see they wrong. Am I making sense here? Somebody say forgive. forgive. Come on, say it again. Say forgive. forgive. I, I need you to catch this now. I need you to catch this. There is no explanation they can give you that can give you closure. You get closure when you decide. And if you decide closure is tied to an explanation, then that's when you'll get it. But if you decide you're not waiting on one to have closure, then that's when you get it. Am I making sense? It's essential and important it helps us experience life as God intended. Forgiveness. I accept the blood of Jesus as full and satisfactory payment for what you did to me. Forgiveness. Now, that's what God say about forgiveness. <laughs> Let me tell you what he didn't say. God didn't say that reconciliation regarding the issue means reconnection with the individual. Y'all missed that. <clears throat> Did you hear what I just said? 
Yeah, forgiveness doesn't mean reconnection. No, God didn't say that. Come on here. And, and when many people, when many people make decisions that lack relational intelligence is because they've confused a person being remorseful with a person being repentant. Did you hear what I just said? Yeah, being remorseful means you're sorry. It doesn't mean you changed. So after you get through crying, I want to know, did you change? After you send me an apology letter, did you change? After you show up at my house, pull up on me at work, singing me songs, I need to know. Did you change? Come on here. Because Dr. Henry Cloud says, never go back if the reason you left is still there. The Bible says repentance has fruit. There needs to be fruit or evidence of change that makes me feel comfortable enough to re-engage relationally. I got an obligation to reconcile the issue. I do not have an obligation to reconnect unless I see fruit that make me feel safe. Where did you get that, Pastor? The Bible. In the book of chapter, uh, in the book of Acts, chapter number thirteen, you'll see the Bible says that the uh, that uh, God's church is ministering to the Holy Spirit. That's what the text says: ministering to Him. That's worship. That's praise. That's prayer. And the Holy Spirit says to me, says to them, set aside for me Paul and Barnabas for the work that I've assigned to them. So Barnabas was a ministry partner with Paul, and the Bible says they did ministry together. And they get ready to make a shift in their missionary journey, and they get ready to go to a place called Philippi. And the Bible says. As Barnabas wanted to take a dude with him named John Mark. And Paul say, John Mark can't go with me. <laughs> See, y'all not ready. The apostle Paul wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. And he said, he can't go with me. He's a man that God used to work miracles with. Did you hear? I mean, he, he, he worked miracles. And he said, uh, John Mark can't go. Because Paul and John Mark had a little beef. And Paul had forgiven John Mark, so there was reconciliation with the issue, but Paul didn't feel the obligation for reconnection. Come on here. Barnabas wanted John Mark so bad that Barnabas said, well, if you don't have John Mark, you don't have me. Paul say, well, y'all have each other. Paul was not being petty. This was not some petty dispute. Paul and John Mark had done ministry together. And John Mark had deserted Paul in a previous season. And Paul knew he was getting ready to go into hostile territory. And going into hostile territory, he needed a ministry partner that had demonstrated some stability. Did you hear what? So I love Paul's posture because he's looking at Barnabas and saying, I'm not going to pick your friends. I'm not going to tell you who you can be friends with. So if you want to be friends with John Mark, knowing that me and John Mark have beef, that's okay. But because I'm not going to pick your friends, don't you get mad when I pick mine. So I'm not going to pick your friends, but I will choose my friends based on who they friends with. Let me go over here. So I'm going to let you choose John Mark. Don't be mad at me when I don't choose you. Because of who you chose. I'm not judging John Mark, but if you're able to connect with somebody like that, if you're able to be close with somebody like that, if you're able to tolerate somebody like that, it makes me wonder, is a little bit of that in you? So maybe this is God's way of showing me what's in you before you do something to me. So you and... And so God brings somebody into Paul's life named Silas. And Paul and Silas end up in prison. And instead of Silas abandoning Paul, the Bible says, and at midnight... Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. 
You need a Silas that won't leave you when you're in prison. You need a Silas that said, we're going to praise him in the prison together. I don't know who this is for, but this is your Silas season. God is sending you stable friends. Gotta go. Send him a Silas. And if he would have tried to force it with John Mark, he would have missed this Silas. Some of you are trying to force stuff with people because of history. And sometimes we're romanticizing relationships. I'm done, Tario. We're romanticizing relationships when if you step back and look at it objectively, you can kind of see this really hasn't been good a long time. But because we've had so much history, it's blinded me to what this really is. They've been using me for a minute. Y'all let me, let me go. They, I've, I've really been doing all to give it in this relationship. When you try to force it with John Mark, you miss your Silas. And I feel this. Some of y'all need to hear me. You in the seat. Silas represents stable. I'm in a Silas season. That's the season of life I'm in. I'm in a Silas season. I need stable. I'm clear. I need clear people with me. There's nothing wrong with you not being clear. It just means you're not right for me in this season. So there was forgiveness. Paul didn't harbor unforgiveness, but there wasn't reconnection. And what did he do? He held a boundary. Barnabas tried to get him to break that boundary. He wouldn't break it. Because Barnabas probably didn't want to be in a position where he had to choose. And you don't always have to choose, but sometimes love makes you choose. Sometimes love requires a choice. And don't be afraid, don't be apologetic when life put people in situations where they got to make one. You in a season where you need stable. Yeah. I'm speaking to somebody that grew up and you're saying, Pastor, I never had it. I hear you. I never had it in my own house. I never had it from my parents. I don't even know what stable feel like. All I know is me. All my life has been me and God. But you hit a season where you need Silas. Because sometimes life puts you in prisons. And it's better when you're in there with a Silas. <laughs> when life gets hard, you need a Silas. But if you're jaded, Lord, I don't have time. If you're jaded by what John Mark did and you don't forgive, then you become suspicious of your Silas. <laughs> so now you're looking at Silas. <laughs> you're looking sideways at Silas. Forgiveness. Here's my pivot, and we'll wrap up with this. It's one thing 
to know how to exercise this muscle of forgiveness with others. Here's where I'm landing the plane today. It's another to exercise this muscle of forgiveness with you. And this is what I've learned with most people. This is not data-driven. It's anecdotal. My experience as a pastor. People who are really serious about their spiritual journey are much better at giving grace to other people. They're way better at giving grace to other people than they are to themselves. You must, if you're going to be all God's called you to be, you must not just use this superpower of forgiveness with others. You got to learn how to use it with you. And the Apostle Paul was one who struggled with that, but he teaches us how to do it. See, when we read what he wrote, we need to, we need to be clear on who wrote it. I want y'all to understand, this man wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, but you need to know his past. This man helped kill Christians. Not kill them metaphorically, literally. We call him Paul because his name got changed from Saul. He was named after the first king of Israel, Saul, who was from the tribe of Benjamin. Paul's from the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew circumcised on the eighth day, a Pharisee, trained at the University of Tar Tar uh, Tarsus. He schooled on the rabbinical tutelage of Gamaliel, spoke between seven and ten languages. When he went out in apostolic ministry, they sent Peter to the Jews. They sent Paul to the Gentiles because he could talk to anybody. And he goes to Mars Hill and he speaks to Stoics and Epicureans. He's quoting their own philosophy philosophers. He's on Mars Hill. He sees statues that are dedicated to certain gods. And there's one statue that says to the unknown God. And Paul stands and debates with philosophers and aristocrats and says, this is who this unknown God is. He's the real God. That man used to kill Christians. And now he becomes one. You don't think he carrying guilt? You don't think the devil keep reminding him. How you going how you gonna serve people? Jesus. Knowing what you did. Jesus. Watch this. How dare you correct anybody else's behavior? Woo. Knowing what you did. Jesus. How dare you call yourself Paul an apostle? Knowing what you used to be. You don't think he's carrying that? Now, your history is not Paul's history and my history, not Paul's history, but we're carrying something. We got some regret. Maybe it's relational regret. Maybe it's financial regret. Maybe it's moral regret. I don't know, but we're carrying something. And I love Paul's honesty. And this is where I want to be as a spiritual leader. So my favorite character, obviously, is Jesus in the Bible. But my second is Paul, because I want to be like him. He's far from perfect. But when I read him, I get real. I don't get pretension. I get real. He says to believers in Philippi, Philippi he say, hey, this is my spiritual goal. I want to know Christ better. I want to know him in the power of his resurrection and in the fellowship of his sufferings. He said, this is my goal. But then he says this. But I have not attained it yet. That's real. He says, this is where I'm trying to go. But I'm not there. So he's got clarification. This is where I'm trying to go. Then he's got evaluation. This is where I am, though. And he's so secure in his relationship with God. He knows that he doesn't have to arrive to be loved. Ha <laughs> ha! He knows that I'm perfectly loved where I am, and I won't be loved more when I arrive. So that love, this is where grace throws people off. This is why one theologian calls grace scandalous, because some people think, think that demotivates you from getting better. And it doesn't. It actually motivates you to get better. It's the goodness of God that actually leads you to repentance. Fear and condemnation only produce temporary change. The goodness of the Lord actually causes me to change my mind and change my direction. It's his goodness that leads me to repentance. 
not fear. And that's only the stuff we know about Paul that the Bible wrote about. He's wrestling with more than what we know about. He says, I don't count myself to have in it, but this one thing I do. Forgetting those things that are behind me. It doesn't mean he doesn't remember. It means he no longer punish himself for it. You know what it means? It means that he realizes this is above me now. That I can do nothing to change that. God's got to deal with my past. Because I can't change it. It's above me. Pastor, I wish I'd been a better parent. It's above you now. I wish I had done things differently in my 20s. It's above you now. I wish I hadn't messed up that relationship. It's above you now. I wish I hadn't wasted that money. It's above you now. I'm done. Several years ago, I was having some conversations with my, my pastor. And one day, I'm going to do a teaching on managing mentors. Because most people don't, they don't know how to manage mentors. Because if you got a great one, they're busy. And if they're busy, you have to initiate. And if they're, biz- and if they're great in character, their um, sense of self is not tied to policing your life. So they only go as deep as you invite them in. They're busy, right? And so that's something I learned early on. And so I figured he can't watch my soul if I don't tell him what's going on with it. So we were having a conversation, and I was talking to him about some stuff I was struggling with. Because there was a season in my life I just traveled so much, and I felt so bad as a parent. I still, that's a pain I asked. I used to ask God to take away, and the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, that's your limp. Just like Jacob had a limp, that's your limp. I'm going to always let you feel that. So that you're reminded of what happens when you get out of balance. That you will never regret missing a speaking engagement. But you will regret missing your kid's game. So to this day, there are sometimes I look at. It's a, it's a limp. So I was having a conversation with my pastor. And I was talking about just like some parenting stuff and some leadership stuff. And he's very, he's a very active listener. He doesn't interrupt. He just, he lets you unload very quiet. And then he said to me, he said, all right. He said, he said, you done? I don't want to interrupt. I said, yes, sir. He said, you know, I love you. I said, yes, sir. He said, you know, I want what's best for you. I said, yes, sir. He said, if... He said, first thing I want you to know, you did what you had to do. And you did the best you could with what you knew. So he said, now, did you learn your lesson? I said, yes, sir. He said, okay. Now, if regret would help you in any way, I promise you I'd let you do it. He says, but your past can be a prison that incarcerates you or a school that educates you and God don't pick that you do so right now Darius you got to decide are you going to let that season be a prison that incarcerates you or a school that educates you do you believe he will redeem time do you believe he will take what the enemy meant for evil and turn it for good and I released it because the energy I was spending focusing on who I wish I was was energy that I could spend becoming who I was called to be. It's above me now. I'm done. It's above you now. I'm getting ready to pray a, a benediction over you before I do. I want you in this moment, while the presence of God is in the room and grace is being released, to take a moment to forgive you. This not mama. 
that's not daddy. Lord, I forgive me. It's above me now. You got to fix that. I can't fix it. In this room online, I forgive you. God did not say you have to punish yourself indefinitely because of what you did previously. Father, I pray over every person online and in this room who fights with the pharaohs of their past. Things they wish they'd done differently. Seasons they wish they'd managed differently. I pray that you give them perspective. They did the best they could with what they knew. Give them perspective that this does not have to be a prison. It could be a school. Give them the grace to let it go. Let it go. Let it go. Let it go. New beginning. New mercy. In Jesus' name. Let me release this word of you. It was actually my last point. God did not say. Go to third point media. God did not say that the third one. God did not say that wasted time was lost time. Ah, yeah. Pastor, I wasted time. God's like, I'm not going to let you lose it. I'm going to redeem that. And I'm going to take the rest of your life and what I'm going to do in the rest of your life is going to be so crazy. You're, watch this. You're not just going to be where you would have been. You're going to be ahead of where you would have been. In Jesus' name.